The NFL Draft broke another attendance record as its commissioner pitched a longer regular season. The Arena Football League just relaunched and it's already a mess, and we are diving into the incentives in baseball that are leading to numerous pitcher injuries with the score's Travis Sawcheck. It's Monday, April 29th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. The NFL Draft made another startling display of the NFL's popularity by breaking an attendance record. 775,000 people came to Detroit for the event, up from 312,000 last year in Kansas City. The draft is also a public moment for NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell, who made some news on the Pat McAfee show when he pitched a new schedule for the league. Uh, you know, I, I think I'd rather replace a preseason game with a regular season any day. Uh, that, that's just picking quality, right? So. If we get if we got to 18 and two, that's not an unreasonable thing. The other thing it does, which I thought you were going to, is that ends up on President's Day weekend, which is a three-day weekend, which makes the Sunday night, and then you have Monday off. So that's just to put that all together, that would be two preseason games instead of three, an 18-game regular season, and the Super Bowl on President's Day weekend. Here's the thing with that. If the NFL wants to go to 18 games, the NFLPA is going to need something in return, and there's a pretty obvious starting ask a second bye week. That would push the Super Bowl to the week after President's Day, which seems like a fixable problem. You could just move the whole season up a week, but that might involve talks with the league's media partners, which makes things that much more complicated. The bigger issue is that the game takes an incredible physical toll on players' bodies, but the NFL is the most popular sport in America, and the league wants to max out on what it has. The Arena Football League launched its third iteration over the weekend, and one of its teams may already be imploding. The league existed from 1986 to 2008, relaunched in 2010, shut down again in 2019, and has just begun its third attempt. But one of its 16 teams, the Philadelphia Soul, didn't quite make it to the starting line. On Friday, reports came out shortly before the team's first game on Saturday that most players were given termination forms, effective immediately. Further reports indicated that the players, staff, and coaches had not been paid, and their hotel in New Jersey near their team facility was also not covered, which led the hotel to refuse to release the players' stuff until they received their payment. A source also said that the team had only been provided with one-way tickets to New Orleans, but it doesn't seem like many of them actually got on the plane. Apparently, the players wearing Philadelphia sold jerseys in their 53-18 to loss to Louisiana were mostly players hired from the Dallas Falcons of the American Arena League. Those players might not have been ready for after being called in on short notice, but at least they probably knew the coach. The team hired Dallas Falcons coach Tyrone Washington after the previous head coach, Pat Pimmel, abruptly resigned earlier this week. Who owns this team, you might ask? The answer is the Arena Football League itself owns the soul, or whatever is left of it, and that is not a good sign. All right, I am joined now by Travis Sochik, MLB senior writer at The Score. Welcome, Travis. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So. A lot of the early season discourse has in baseball has been on pitcher injuries. Spencer Strider, you know, the consensus best pitcher in baseball is out for the year. Garrett Cole, you know, in the Cy Young last year is going to miss about half the season. There are many, many others. Uh, you've looked into this. Are there, in fact, more injuries this year? It sure seems that way, which is why I, I looked into it. And uh, the, it's it's bad, but my takeaway is that it's, always been this bad this time of year early in the season at least over the last decade and we looked at we looked at the Tommy John database and for the first 100 days of the calendar year dating back to uh, you know the first Tommy John surgery and really the first 100 days are not uh, elevated the major league level but if we include the minor league level it's not it's not an outlier first 100 days uh, in in recent years. And I think it's just, you know, the names you mentioned, the Striders, the Garrett Coles, the Shane Beavers, that makes it seem, not that Coles headed for Tommy John surgery, but uh, it just, the names involved with elbow injuries make it seem worse than it is. But that's also not to say that it, it's good. And I, I think, you know, there, there are too many injuries. I think 37% of pitchers on rosters today in the majors have had Tommy John surgery, which is, it's remarkable. I, I suppose it speaks to the quality of the procedure and the return to play uh, programs in place, but it also speaks to that's a lot of injuries and that's a lot of stress on on the human body. So, yeah, I guess to summarize, it is uh, it's certainly not good, 
but it's also in line with recent years, which is uh, surprising. Yeah, that that thirty seven percent figure is pretty remarkable. Didn't realize. I mean, it makes enough sense. Didn't realize it was that high, though. There does seem to be a a causal relationship, probably between throwing harder and getting injured. Do you think there's something to that? Yeah, I, I think there there certainly is. It's just it's tough to isolate any one variable. But when you do look at the the highest velocity guys, uh, their injury injury rates do seem to be higher than the, you know, the overall general population of pitchers and they are acting rationally. I mean, you look at offensive performance against higher velocities and it's lower. You look at who is drafted in the early rounds of the draft. Uh, you're not going to see many low velocity arms who enjoys above average major league pay. Generally it starts with they're, they're very good pitchers. And generally that starts with an above average fastball. So I think pitchers know the risks, but they also know the rewards. And it was Tyler Glass, know, the other day on Chris Rose's podcast, who was, you know, he, he mentioned the one year when he tried to not sell out for velocity. He had a 7.7 .7 ERA in, in Pittsburgh. And he said, you know, he, he pitchers know the risk, but they're always going to make this decision with where the game is because that's the incentives, the financial reward, the performance rewards are all in many ways tied to pitch quality, which, and velocity is a huge component of that. So it's, uh, no one wants to see these injuries, but it's also hard to see incentives changing. I, I don't see pitchers, I don't see many pitchers trading velocity to lower injury risk. We only see velocities climbing. So I don't, I don't know how that changes. I don't know if it will change. Uh, you know, perhaps with all the modern training tools, pitch design tools, there'll be a, Maybe there can be more Logan Webbs who uh, become more movement based, more uh, sinker, change up slider based, and can use the high speed cameras and pitch tracking tools to become those types of arms. Maybe there's a window for that. But yeah, the incentives right now are definitely aligned with uh, taking on that risk for the, chasing that reward. You wrote a, a book called The MVP Machine about these modern. Um, ways that players, pitchers, and hitters are are trying to get better. You know, driveline baseball, I think, is the most well known of those. Um, where you know, they they teach pitchers to throw harder, but also to uh, you know they work with hitters. They they help pitchers come up with new pitches. Yeah, do you see a path in that direction? Of you know, maybe even if we're not solving the whole velocity conundrum, um, at least kind of creating new ways for pitchers to be effective without adding a couple miles an hour to their fastball? Yeah, it's a great question. And I do think there are folks in baseball looking into this. And uh, again, I think Logan Webb is kind of like the, the model for this where, and not everyone moves like Webb, not everyone has the same characteristics, but here's a guy who had Tommy John surgery in 2016, I believe, who the Giants had been at one point. Uh, you know, he was trying to ride the fastball up in the zone, seek out velocity. I think he was hitting 97 when he had the Tommy John surgery. And it was when uh, Brian Bannister, who's now with the White Sox pitching coach, when he came in and the end of 2019, and he, t he told Webb, uh, yeah, you're going to change everything. <laughs> it was like a 45, it was a phone call after Christmas. And Webb said it was like 45 seconds of small talk. And then he went right into, yeah, we're going to change everything you do because this isn't working. And he did become a guy. He lowered his arm slot. He he became a, uh, instead of a north-south arm, to just speak generally, more of an east-west where late movement, uh, arm side, glove side run, sinkers off change-ups and sliders. And he's thrown the six most innings in baseball the last three years. He he's become one of these rare volume guys we just don't see anymore. And you know, pitch design. A lot of the player development focus, as I wrote about in that book, and is really it's only acceler accelerated since then. It's been on force focusing on velocity, four seamers up in the zone, uh, hard breaking stuff off of it. And a lot of these tools could be used to you know, train the web style of pitching if you're interested to it. And we've had breakthroughs like the, not to dive into too nerdy of a uh, rabbit hole, but uh, like seam shifted wake, the way the seams on the ball interact, it it helps a pitcher like Webb. You get more than expected movement if you can harness 
and design pitches where the seams interact with you know the airflow around it in a certain way. So we don't know exactly where the game's going to go. And I think the new technologies uh, allow for new discoveries and understanding of pitching. So uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a solution, but the, yeah. But again, to the original kind of what we're seeing in the game, yeah, the, the injuries, while they're not elevated versus recent years, they're still elevated in regard to historical terms that we know of. And, it is alarming. I mean, to lose a strider so early, to lose, uh, to be without a Garrett Cole. And, you know, Shane Bieber did go to driveline this offseason. He did add velocity. Uh, he also sharpened breaking balls. And and this is a conundrum, right? Like Bieber in his first two starts and in spring looked as good as he'd looked on the mound since he won the, the uh, was it the, tor- the COVID shortened year? I believe he won the Cy Young. He looked as good as he had since that year. And, then he gets hurt. And again, risk reward. He was entering a free agency year. He was trying to be his the best version of what of himself. And you know, did this did his offseason training play a role in injury? It's impossible to say, but it does make sense that the more stress you put on a human body, the more uh, injury risks are going to be elevated. One thing that's kind of come out of this is so MLB, obviously you have the pitch clock now, they shortened it. Um, in this year to make things just a little quicker, um, the MLB PA came out and said, you know, that's why we're seeing all these injuries is pitchers arms aren't getting a chance to, to you know, rest and reload just between pitches. Those, those seconds are, are costing them. And, um, and you know, there's, I mean, you know, it may or may not be true. Obviously your research shows that there, there aren't more injuries from before the pitch clock. Anyway, I, I'm more interested kind of in the like the labor unrest part of this. It feels like, you know, we just had a very contentious CBA negotiation led to a 99 day lockout. The next one's just a couple of years away. And it feels like there's already a lot of tension both within the MLBPA and between the MLBPA and MLB. Um, I, I'm wondering kind of what, what you're forecasting in terms of what we're what we might see um, for the next round of negotiations. Yeah, it already, we're still a few years out and it already feels like it's setting up to be another ugly round of talks. And it'd be surprising if it wasn't ugly at this point. Yeah. I mean, you have the players and owners who are, you know, there's quite a bit of animosity. And in there, I mean, I suppose there always is in a CBA negotiation, but it seems even elevated historically. And there's some fractures between player groups. I mean, you have, uh, there's just different interests. And if, and it really goes back to the last, the vote on the CBA. If we, uh, the time of the last vote, there's the executive player board, which included eight players. They had eight votes and they were made up mostly of uh, veteran star players. I believe five of the eight were Scott Boer's clients. And then you had the general pl- population of player, which accounted uh, for uh, I, I, th- I believe I'm trying to remember this correctly. I think it was another 30 votes or something, but it, the general group of players overwhelmingly supported getting back to accepting the deal and playing and the executive board voted unanimously zero to eight against the deal. So you have these competing interests of players uh, where if you look at performance value on the field, uh, younger players who are in that pre-arbitration group, account for the overwhelming majority of wins above replacement production, roster side. They make up 60% of plate appearances and innings pitched, yet they're generally compensated near the minimum salary in baseball. And that minimum salary has, while it did enjoy a bump in the last deal, it still lags behind those of most of their other North American sport contemporaries. And then you have the interests of the top of the one percenters that want that want to be unencumbered and as free a market as possible. And those interests kind of compete against the general pool. Uh, you have this de facto soft cap of sorts and the tax, luxury tax, which is strengthened over time and nothing on the bottom end to force owners, ownership groups in places like Oakland and Miami and Pittsburgh and Cleveland to meet a minimum uh, payroll floor. Uh, and it's just a whole and revenue sharing, and it's just really a, a mess. And it, if players want to fight for earlier access to free agency, I mean, th- things like that, or even expanded super two, those are just huge fights that would require 
lengthy work stoppages and who's willing to to sacrifice that and owners always have the advantage where they don't have these finite careers like players do that you know the average player career is over in less than three years so how much time are you willing to sit out to really fight for something so yeah it's um it's it's not looking great is how i it's how i would uh state it owen yeah um uh, let's wrap up with a sort of more fun topic um one of your your campaigns in the baseball world is you know, we're probably going to add two teams sometime in the next few years or you know like five six years um then we'll have 32 and it's a nice power of two we can break it into two 16 team leagues um you're advocating i believe for um get rid of interleague play and redo the divisions so um it's you know like the mets and yankees would be in the same division like just, just whoever's closest basically angels and dodgers and padres i guess anyway make the case for me for uh for the the travis sachik realignment yeah i feel uh this is one of my favorite uh exor- thought exercises to go through i try to do it a couple times a year on twitter and, and uh just x to get people uh i don't know i just enjoy the topic and Maybe it comes from the fact that I spent some time covering Clemson athletics before I covered Major League Baseball. And I was around uh, so not just ACC, but SEC and the rivalries that stem from close geographic proximity and uh, just the, the fan interest in you're around your neighbors who follow other teams and you, you talk trash to each other and you get invested uh, in games because of those rivalries. And I think it's hard to substitute that. Uh, I think it's largely tied to geography. And there's a University of Arkansas study a few years ago that showed that, uh, you know, most rivalries, especially in college, are tied to geography. And I think, uh, yeah, and there's travel benefits too, if you can reduce this for players and fans traveling. But mostly my motivation was, how can we uh, increase fan interest? And I think great rivalries help that. And could you imagine an AL East we have the Phillies, Mets, Yankees, Red Sox, uh, you know, Orioles. If Montreal came in with the Blue Jays in that division too, you would all you would have these great rivalries uh, that would be played more often. That wouldn't be tied to only interleague play in some cases that they are today. Or you could have a, you know a California-based four-team division or a Great West Coast division. You could have uh, Cubs, White Sox, Brewers all. Play. So, yeah, I, I think it would be fantastic. And I'm a all, interleague play. I, you know, the feedback is that most people like interleague play. So I don't, <laughs> I don't, I might have to rethink that. But I do think benef- baseball's jewel showcase events, like the World Series, like the All Star Game, benefited from a little mystery in the past. Like you weren't sure quite which league was better. You never saw these guys play each other. And I think interleague play is. And I know folks will push back on this, but I think it's just less important when every game is televised for the most part, unless you're in a blackout restricted area, which is a topic for another day. But we just we see these guys more often. And I in this age of so many wild cards, I I also think there should be just more games against teams competing for these playoff berths and fewer to zero, you know, play. Do we really need Rockies Royals early in the season? Uh but yeah, I, I, my greater passion, though, is really in uh, advocating for these geographic alignments. And I think there's all sorts of benefits from reducing travel, which should help the on-field product, to just creating more geographic-based rivalries, which, I mean, Duke, North Carolina, Alabama, Auburn, Ohio State, most of the great rivalry, Yankees, Red Sox, most of these great rivalries are tied because you're close to each other. So I think proximity matters. Yeah, absolutely. I think I'm for it. Travis Sachik, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. Travis Sachik, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be with you, and thank you. That's it for today. Leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to tune in. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.